We now welcome on legendary guard from the 1983 NC State Wolfpack, Derek Wittenberg, who is also the executive producer on my all-time favorite sports documentary, The 30 for 30 Survive in Advance. Derek, how are we doing? I'm doing terrific, and uh, this is my first podcast with, with the Duke guy. <laughs> so this, this is pretty exciting, and uh, uh, let's, let's have some fun today. All right, let's start this off. So I don't think many people realize when you went to state, you went to go play for Norm Sloan instead of Jim Valvano, correct? That's correct. Norm Sloan uh, uh, recruited me, actually coached my cousin. Everybody knows David Thompson, who went to NC State and won the championship in 74. So uh, I kind of wanted to follow uh, David Thompson and play in the ACC. And I loved the little crazy man with the checkered jacket. <laughs> Time left in Drizelle, which Damatha High School, my high school, was probably two miles from from Maryland. Uh, I, I, I would have had an opportunity to go to Maryland, but uh, they were stacked up with guards, and uh, so NC State was primarily my first choice. And once I got the opportunity, I, I went with State. So, how close was Morgan Wooten to taking the NC State job? Uh, very close. Uh, he was offered the job. Uh, he went home and, and, and thought about it, and uh, it, it, the family was in a crossroads because the kids were still relatively young. He had five kids at the time, and uh, he was doing so well, uh, not just school-wise, but he had a, a very good basketball summer camp that he was doing well financially. So it, it wasn't pressing that he had to move for the money or – uh, it's for another opportunity. He had a good opportunity, and uh, he decided to stay. How different is your life if Morgan Wooten takes that job instead of Jim Valvano? I don't know if it'd be any different because we, mm -hmm. we probably would have won a national championship with Morgan as well. So, <laughs> yeah, remember that uh, I was part of Morgan's first high school national championship in 1978. We went 28-0. And so, uh, so we were used to winning with Morgan. I only lost seven games in high school in my three years at DeMatha. Sidney Lowe obviously was my backcourt mate, but uh, we, we won a lot of games at, at uh, DeMatha, won a lot of championships. And so I don't think it would have been any different because Morgan was very capable of taking that uh, NC State team to the national championship. When Jimmy V comes to NC State, was there any thought of transferring? Uh, for me, not really. I think there was some apprehension just because it was such a shock. Uh, I had no intention to transfer. Uh, uh, NC State's where I wanted to be. And uh, I just wanted to give the new coach an opportunity. And um, I, I never had transfers in, in my mind at all. So for people who weren't alive then or anything like myself, what was it like day to day with Jimmy V and that team? Uh, Jim had an infectious personality. He was more of a player's coach. He made uh, practice fun. We had a lot of fun. He encouraged us to have fun. He gave us a lot of ownership in the team. Uh, he was not the conventional coach. Mm -hmm. and, um, it worked for us. I mean, he loved to play basketball and practice a lot. We did a lot of shooting. We played. We didn't do a lot of drill work, but that's that was his philosophy. And um, I just enjoyed playing for him. He, he was just uh, his personality. And, and at the end of the day, he, we knew he cared about us. And we cared about him. And we wanted to run through a wall for him. And, and uh, we just believed in him. And he believed in us. And the chemistry was just great with, with Jimmy V. So on that 83 title run, you guys have to win the ACC tournament and you go through Ralph Sampson twice. Looking back, what are your chances of beating Ralph Sampson twice? Well, <laughs> we didn't we didn't beat him the first eight times. So <laughs> <laughs> we were zero and eight <laughs> it's Ralph. So uh uh, uh you know, next to impossible, but you know, this is college basketball. And any given night. Uh, a team can 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 uh, beat the, the the better team, and uh, we were a good basketball team. But just you know, Ralph was just a dominating player that uh, you know hard to contain. But we had two great games against Ralph in the ACC tournament, 
And then in the Western Regions finals, then underdogs both times and up, upset Big Ralph uh, in, in two of the most important games of our senior year and probably of his senior year. <laughs> so going into that title game, were y'all nervous or were you just had nothing to lose kind of feel? Oh, I think we were numb. I, and I say that because, you know, once you go through, you, you get used to winning and it becomes a habit and it just becomes a norm. I, I don't, I don't think you really think about your, uh, I don't think about you think about being nervous. I think you think about, you anticipate being excited. I think you anticipate the moment and, um, uh, you embraced the moment. I never felt like I was nervous. I think that because we talked about it and now that we were here, I think we just, we just embraced the moment and, 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 and was going to go out there and, and give it all we got and let the chips fall where they may. How many times a day do you think about that pass to Lorenzo Charles? Well, I wouldn't say I would think about it. I would say somebody reminds me like you did this year, <laughs> today. Somebody every day reminds me with an email or a text or Facebook or, or Twitter. Somebody reminds me for the last 37 years of my life about that 83 championship game. And uh, it's hard for me to get away from it. That's But that's what you – if you do something extraordinary that was just unique, the way we won that championship, I don't think nobody re re can forget it. And I think the 30 for 30 in 2013 really gave it more life, right? Mm -hmm. So now some people like yourself who wasn't born saw the 30 for 30 and now it's, it's given us more life. And, uh, and I, I just think that it's, it's a hard run to duplicate. I don't think nobody has been able to duplicate that kind of run. Does it necessarily bother you that people will only bring that up sometimes? Well, I, I understand what in people's space, you know, basketball was part of a talent that I was given that uh, it's a part of me, but it's not all of me. Mm -hmm. And really, I, I've proven that in many ways and I've accomplished so many things other than basketball. But uh, when you're making a comments like that, I, I just understand what people's, you know, because people don't get a chance to know you. And so that's why I've been in the process of writing a book and telling people about, you know, who Derek Wittenberg really is and what's his passions and, and um, you know, what's truly important to him. And I'm not just a basketball player, basketball coach. There's a lot of other things that I have passions about and that, that I think about every day. Uh, that's uh, just as important as, as what I did in basketball. So you leave NC State on the high of highs beating that crazy Houston team. What's it like having to leave NC State? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's part of the process. It's part of your journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a senior, and now you have to go off into your, your next phase, your next journey, and Mine's when I left, I, you know, I went to the Phoenix Suns and then I was cut by the Phoenix Suns. And then I, I went over to Europe for a year and then uh, I decided I wanted to come back and coach. And that's where, what I started my coaching career. And I uh, went to about 10, 10 some odd different schools. And uh, I enjoyed that journey. I uh, had a lot of success, took Wagner College to the first NCAA tournament, uh, Fordham University to the highest winning percentage they had ever in Atlantic 10, uh, winning 18 games and 10 games in the league. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, and I'm proud of some of the things that I, I accomplished as a head coach and as assistant coach in basketball. And then uh, even after um, uh, coaching, I, I'm proud of some of the things I've been involved with uh, outside of coaching. And so, you know, that's all part of your journey. I mean, you, I tell kids all the time, I speak, uh, I do a lot of speaking engagements across the country. I like to talk to the 99%. 99% of the young athletes that go into college, not only may not play professional, but they might not even play their sport again. Mm -hmm. And so I, I talk to them about, listen, it, it's, a, it, it's important that you understand that you can be successful in life. And your life is just beginning just because you can't play a sport again. 
So embrace that, and and, and let's look forward to uh, look look forward to uh, embracing the the second part of your life, which could be very very rewarding. You t- so you mentioned embracing the second part of your life. They always say athletes die twice. What was that like realizing, okay, basketball's over. Let's move on to the next phase. Were you more excited or you're like, oh, crap? <laughs> I don't believe in that statement at all. Uh, athletes die twice because now I, I never look at that. Uh, mm-hmm. I never look that way because to me, that means that all you think about is that, that you think you're going to be a, a play, play that sport for the rest of your life. So that, uh, to me, that statement is off in my opinion. Because listen, you get an opportunity to go to college, and uh, and and you you get the chance. You earned a scholarship, and you have four years of eligibility, five years to play, four years of of your sport, and you do the best you can, mm-hmm. and and hopefully out of experience that you come out a much more mature and better person. Obviously, if you get your education and get your degree, that's key. You, you must become educated and finish your degree. That's a two part. And then you do the best you can and, and have the best experience you can in that sport. I just happened to win a national championship, but mm-hmm. well, you know what, how many people won a national championship since I was in school? Not very many. Mm-hmm. So I'm saying to myself, you know, athletes don't die twice because you get one opportunity to do it in college. And if you don't do it in the pros, that's so, so be it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not dying. That's just part of you. You know, so I, I get caught up when you mentioned it early about people only identify me by the basketball because that's all they know. But when they get to know me and what I'm about and the things that I'm involved in, they'll see that it's a lot more to me than just, uh, you know, playing basketball. So transitioning to the 30 for 30, what prompted y'all to make it? Well, it was interesting. I just, uh, I had just been fired at Fordham university. Mm-hmm. And so I was sitting around, I was contemplating a, um, a career at ESPN. And then I called my friend up Jonathan Hawk and said, um, you know, I think we got a great, uh, an opportunity to, to do a great story about, about the 83 tape. And I simply, that's how it happened. And uh, we put this film together. It took us about uh, almost two years uh, to get everything completed. And we had no idea. It was just about me telling the story 30 years ago about my extraordinary team and about NC State and that run. And we we didn't have an idea how good it was going to be or how bad it was going to be. We were just telling the story. And it was just so natural. It It turned out great. And then if I would have continued to coach, I would have never gotten the opportunity to to produce the Survive in Advance, which 68 million people watched last Christmas. So it's the most watched sports documentary world. It's probably not a sports story. It's a a life story. Mm -hmm. It's a story about persevering and and, and coming back from your trials and tribulations. It's, It's a story about you know, the ordinary people achieving something extraordinary. And it's about leadership. It's about belief. It's about a man with a vision that believed in us. And we, we made, and he, you know, he made our dreams come true. So a uh, lot of powerful messages in that film. I uh, hope more people get an opportunity to watch it uh, because it's got so many positive messages. In, and I just think everybody that watches this really, really enjoys that film. Yeah. I really think the most special part about that documentary was when each of the players of whether it was the assistant coaches, the grad assistants or the players were able to talk one-on-one about coach V. And then also when y'all were at that dinner or lunch together, what was, whose idea was that dinner and what was that like? Well, that was strictly my idea because uh, when I told Jonathan and other producers, I said, I, I want to get you an opportunity to show the personalities of our team. Mm-hmm. I said, the only way to show that is that we sit in this round table and just let us go. Yeah. Don't script it. Just let us be who we are. And that was totally a unscripted scene. You could tell. Just like, we, just like we had a reunion and we were just talking and they just had the film rolling. And uh, I had no idea it was going to turn out that way, but it turned out great because we were just being ourselves. And it's being natural. And that's 
the way we were. We just we were a fun loving group and a close group. Not that we particularly hung with each other, but it was just a lot of respect and everybody understood their role and their place on the team and everybody respected that. And that's why we, we, we had great chemistry on that team. Was that your favorite part of the doc, making the documentary? That was a favorite part, but one of my favorite parts is, is, is going to the cemetery. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason why I say that I do that quite often. It's a, it's a way for me to reflect on Lorenzo and to reflect on Coach B, who was more than a coach for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a very close relationship, and most people know. You know, he uh, put me on the Jimmy V uh, board. I'm a lifetime member there. And just, uh, you know, we just had a special relationship. So uh, that's frequent for me to to visit the seminary there and just, just reflect on our relationship and how much I appreciate uh, God bringing uh, Jim Valvano and uh, late Renzo Charles in my life. All right. I won't take much more of your time. Give me your best Jimmy V story. The best Jimmy V story I can say I was in high school Mm -hmm. and um, we were playing in the Boston shootout up in Boston, big AAU tournament. And uh, I was on the Washington DC AAU team and then uh, we played against New York and everybody in the country wanted to watch DC and New York, two of the top cities around. They wanted to see them play. We won a triple overtime game uh, at the Boston against New York. We come in in the lobby and this crazy Italian guy, which happened <laughs> to be Jim Valvano at the time, comes by and grabs me and Sidney Lowe and says, Hey, man, I'm Jim Valvano from Iona College, man. I love you two guys. Won't you guys come play for me? So, you know, we just said, you know, we just kind of say, hey, coach, how you doing? And so it's like a joke. A year later, here he comes walking in the press conference. And I looked over to Sydney. I said, hey, that's that, that's that crazy coach that grabbed us a year ago talking about he owned a college. And he said, no, that's not. He doesn't own a college. That's I own a college. <laughs> and so that's that's my first uh, story of Jimmy V and first encounter of him. I got so many of them. Some I can tell you and some I can't. But uh, uh, he was just uh, his, his, his personality was infectious. Mm-hmm. I mean, people just drew to this man. I, I just can't tell you how magnetic he was in terms of just reaching people. You can meet Jim Valvano one time and feel like he was a lifelong friend. That's that's what kind of effect he had on you. He loved life. He loved people. And um, I just think that uh, I'm just so humbled and honored and privileged that I had the opportunity to work and play for Jim Valvano. Well, Derek, I could do this all day, but I don't want to take too much of your time. Thank you so much. Go follow Derek on Twitter at NC State. Hey, thank you again. Go check out the 30 for 30 if you haven't already. All right, great. Thank you. Happy New Year to you, brother. I hope to see you soon. You too. Thank you.